So okay. I'm going to go ahead and say hi to everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I have Mike Yanisak with us from Gelfand Renner and Feldman. Yes, that's correct. Hi, everybody. Um, you are a tour, I, I, I label you as tour accountant to the stars. Some people say that, so it works. <laughs> So I know Mike from um, settling lots of shows in minor league baseball parks around the country uh, many moons ago. Um, we were out with Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson and uh, we got to see lots of baseball parks. Lots of them. We definitely did. Yeah, it was great. It was a great run for a few summers for sure. Yeah. So why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about how you ended up um, as a tour accountant. Okay, the Reader Digest version. Sure. Um, I've pretty much my whole life always been in music. Uh, I started playing guitar when I was 12 and then played through school and then uh, I went professional, played 10 years professionally. Never made the, uh, you know, big time rock star, but I, I love playing. So I played professionally uh, for about 10 years. And then I knew that I might need to switch gears. So I went back to school and I went into accounting because I looked in the newspaper and there was a lot of accounting ads. And so I said, oh, maybe somebody will hire me because I never had a job other than music. So um, I became an accounting major. And then uh, after college, I got hired by PricewaterhouseCoopers. It was Coopers and Library at the time and then became PricewaterhouseCoopers. And a year after I was there, they had acquired um, this business management firm in L.A., Gelfin and Feldman, which I work at, uh, who deal mostly with music clients and other entertainment clients. And I thought, well, maybe I'll transfer over. Maybe that'd be a good fit. So I transferred over, got involved in music and touring. And then in 1998, uh, Marty Feldman had retired, so they needed somebody else to kind of take over doing some road work and also starting a tour division. So um, I took the opportunity and been on the road for 20 years. It's hard so to be home, isn't it? So now, yeah, so now I'm grounded. Now um, traveling has stopped. My last, uh, my last tour was in March. I came home March 13th and I, I may not go out till next March 13th. We'll see how uh, we'll see how the how the pandemic uh, pans out here. But anyways, yeah. So I do lots of touring. About I'm out about 200 days a year. So worked on lots of tours, lots of tours in the office. Um, like I said, major concert tours all over the world. So hopefully, um, hopefully I'll have some um, good uh, good stuff to talk about. So let's see what happens. You're going to have fantastic stuff to talk about. Um, so let's start with um, what, what does a business management firm do? Like what do business managers do for their clients? Well, pretty much, you know, overall personal financial planning, you know, is probably uh, the main thing. Um, you know, full business management is like, you know, collecting receipts, paying bills for the clients. Um, obviously the clients can focus on their, their work, their craft, their art. So they don't have to worry about, oh, am I current on my taxes? Uh, have I paid, uh, have I paid my bills? Uh, you know, collecting royalties, uh, so on and so forth, you know? So with business management, I mean, it's like, you know, insurance planning, retirement planning, the day-to-day -day stuff, cash flows, uh, you know, just overall personal financial, you know, assistance and planning for the clients. And every client's unique and different. So there's different levels of services. And within our firm, we have, um, you know, the main business management, and then we have disciplines for royalties and taxes and tour accounting. Believe that because a lot of our clients are music clients about 80 75 percent 80 percent of our clients are music clients so we have a tour accounting division and we have we're the only firm with on the road tour accountants so we actually go out with a lot of our clients and other non-client for um you know clients that aren't clients of the, the firm um and we do um you know take care of the tour accounting because there's a lot going on when a tour goes on i like to kind of say the circus is coming to town 
you know. In 1910, it was a circus. Now the concert touring is like that. Well, we come in, we set up all the gear, right? We do the show. At the end of the show, we take all the gear, load the trucks, go to the next town. So that's what the circus did, right? Only they were on the train and they set up tents. And they stayed, I think, in town a little longer, right? So, I mean, we're basically carnies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your firm, it does a whole big, holistic, comprehensive, everything that's happening in the artist's career. So you're overseeing long-term financial planning, financial strategies, the, how to, when it comes to recording revenues or touring revenues, how all of those pieces are fitting together. And you're overseeing uh, the planning and the taxes and the, like you said, the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. yeah. So that's and hopefully, and hopefully they listen to us. Right. So do you have situations sometimes where you give what you think is really solid advice and they go, nope, I'm going to go buy that anyway? Or, Well, sometimes, you know, I mean, let's face it, you know, I mean, you know, you do the best you can, right? But yeah, uh, you know, uh, we throw it all out there. So, so let's say um, an artist is preparing to go on tour. At what point in the routing or the planning process, where, where do you come into play? Do you get involved with um, helping determine if a tour is feasible financially kind of early on? Or like when is your first kind of involvement in a, a tour? Yeah, I'd say probably not at the very, you know, onset. I think I think, uh, you know, it's between management and the artist and, and what the, you know, what the artist wants to do. Um, and the management certainly guides, guides that. And then the management will start, you know, working with, you know, the agents and the promoters and to see, you know, what a good plan of attack is if the artist wants to go out on tour, you know. And so that's kind of what happens in the beginning, you know. And then, you know, working with, you know the production manager and the tour managers for the all the logistics and then slowly you know you know numbers start to appear and uh and we uh you know we can start crunching you know crunching some numbers so uh when does the budgeting process start for a tour you know as soon as you can obviously there's things that are happening you know constantly until sometimes the day before everyone leaves for the tour, you know? Uh, but, you know, you put in as much as you can and, uh, you know, then you have some contingencies and hopefully the more you know, the less of a contingency you have, right? Yeah, so it's kind or of the a- the less you know, yeah. It's a, a it's a li the, the tour budget tends to be a little bit of a living document that is continually evolving and more information comes in. Um, at the very beginning, are you looking at projected revenue streams? Do you take all of the potential revenue streams in account? Or are you just looking at show guarantees when you're trying to balance those uh, revenues with expenses? What, are you, what, what kind of silos of revenue are you looking at when you're comparing it to the touring expenses? Yeah, I'd say, you know, I'd say first and foremost, obviously that, you know, the concert guarantees, you know, for the tour, you know, if you got a tour with, you know, 30 dates or whatever, and then you can kind of, you know, see what the deals are and what, what the deals are going to be and then go from there. And then you have your ancillaries, you have maybe, you know, depending on the nature of the artist, you know, you could have fan club, VIP income, merchandising income, sponsorship, things like that, you know which are all secondary, but yeah, the main emphasis is, uh, you know, the show guarantees, you know, and then, you know, depending on how the deals are cut, you know, you want to be maybe conservative and not consider, you know, show percentages and overages. Maybe you want to just go with a conservative approach, you know, um, you know, and then go from there for the revenue side. Do you kind of then, once you've got a picture of what that revenue potentially could be, are, is there uh, a conversation where you're shooting for a net profit after the expenses that the artist wants to go home with? Or uh, is there any kind of target on, well, as long as we don't lose money, we're okay, or? Yeah, I mean, uh, nobody wants a break even tour. You know, you certainly want to, you know, um, you know, you certainly want to make some money, especially now. I mean, years ago, you know, 70s and 80s, 
you know, uh, it was a, a, a totally different scene. Touring wasn't as important as it is today, you know. Um, you know, the records, you know, the records were turning out from the record companies and the record company would give you tour support. You'd go out, you promote the album, you know, and the record company said, here, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you 25 grand or something or 50 grand or, you know, depending on the nature of the artist, you know, because they wanted to sell records. Well, obviously now things have changed so much. I mean, it went from records to cassettes to CDs to, you know, downloading, streaming and, you know, the internet. So now people aren't buying albums like they used to in the 60s and 70s, you know, and, and cassettes and CDs in the 80s. So, you know, things have changed quite a bit. So touring now is like major source of income, you know, um, you know, and then along with merchandising and ancillaries and things like that. So um, it really has changed quite a bit from, you know, where it started, you know. So, um a greater importance is placed on having a substantial bottom line number. It used to be that to, uh, artists were touring in order to sell more records. Now they are recording records so that they have uh, to promote the touring, right? Yeah, um, more or less, yeah. Where was my next question going? So uh, we've talked about the revenue, we're aiming for some sort of bottom line number. And um, now we get into like the fun part that's really evolving, the expenses. So what, what, what are the first conversations that you're having that sort of um, figure out some of these big expense categories? Are you talking to your artist about what kind of show they want or what kind of transportation they want? Like where, where's the starting point for the conversations on how the expenses kind of shake out? Well, I mean, obviously tours that go on from, you know, uh, artists that tour from year to year. I mean, a lot of things are already in place. The artist travels by, you know, plane or, you know, buses or, you know, and the, you know, the, the, the production, you know, is a lot the same, but the show itself could change from tour to tour. Right. So I think, I think the first thing, you know, we think about is the startup costs. Okay. What does the production want to be? What are we going to have, you know, video screens or trees on the stage or whatever. And then, so, and then um, depending on how long they've been in, you know, uh, off, you know, re rehearsal time, you know, startup time to get the tour, you know, running, you know, so we need, you know, three weeks to rehearse or to break in the tour and, you know, get everything in place. The production manager, you know, um, you know, setting up the different production elements of what we need, you know, for the tour, um, you know, video content, you know, all kinds of stuff, depending on once again, the nature of the tour, whether you're, you know, four guys in a van going from, you know, club to theaters, you know, for, you know, two months or whether you're an international artist with, you know, you know, with 12 trucks and, you know, five buses, you know, and you're playing arenas and, um, you know, outdoor, you know, amphitheaters. So I think, you know, I think, a, you know, a startup cost, uh, you know, that you can amortize over the tour is an, an important, um, you know, uh, element. And then, of course, people, you need people on the tour. So you have salaries and payroll and per diems and payroll taxes. So that's a key element because without, without people, you usually won't have a tour. So you need the band and musicians and the crew techs and the staffing. And then uh, the other consideration is, you, you know, like you mentioned, you know, the transportation, you know, buses and trucks, you know, how much equipment do we have? Well, how, many, how many trucks do we need to move everything around? Uh, buses, uh, a small tour, you could have a bus and a trailer with gear, you know. Um, and then uh, flying from point A to point B. Uh, so, so why do a budget? So what's important about the budget? Well, you know, I'll tell you one thing about the budget. Not only uh, for your bottom line, but also there's certain people that might want the budget to reduce your state taxes or, um, you know, withholding taxes. So a budget becomes really, really important, not only to, to see how you're doing and measuring, you know, uh, how the tour is doing successfully wise from a financial perspective, but you also have, hey, do you have a budget so we can reduce your taxes if you're playing the state of Wisconsin from 6% to 2%. So, so you've got to have a budget for that re reason as well. I think you're talking about non-resident entertainer tax. Yes. Um, 
do you, well, I guess now that I have said the title of what that is, it's somewhat self-explanatory. So, uh, do you, but can you explain what non-resident entertainer tax is since we're talking about it? Well, there's certain states that, that have withholding taxes. Some states have a flat withholding tax and other states, you know, want to, when you come into their state and play, you know, so we're talking about, you know, domestic tours in the U.S., um, you know, you give them a budget and they may have a withholding tax of, let's say, 6%, but if you show them a budget, uh, here's our guarantee, here's our budget, this is what we're going to make, and they could reduce that, you know. It's the same way as, you know, when you do your income tax return, obviously, you know, you know, you have your income and you maybe offset it with some deductions, you know, to lower your tax rate. So uh, I only bring that up because, you know, not, you know, that's one of the, one of the things that we're really, you know, under the gun with is to provide a, a, you know, a budget, you know, for taxing agencies, you know. So the tour budget really becomes a Bible for so many reasons, you know, not only for management and, and business management, you know, to look at as a tool and to provide the financial results, but, you know, for uh, helping, you know, to mitigate taxes. Yeah. It does. And one of the things that I think really sets uh, top tier tour accountants apart from um, people that are maybe still getting their footing in it is the proactiveness of things like trying to reduce those important taxes in advance of the show. To know that that's a thing to do, to know how to go about doing that, to know who you're, I mean, sometimes I mean, we've all, Dan in Massachusetts, right? Like Dan Elliott. <laughs> We have the same birthdays. You get to know the like the tax person in that state. Um, so let's back up for a second, though. I think that uh, the communication between production manager, who's figuring out some of who's figuring out how to execute the art, the artistic vision that the artist has. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, the relationship between production manager and tour accountant, where. Um, do you sometimes see uh, champagne wishes and caviar dreams on a, a, a Miller Lite budget or uh, how do those pieces kind of fit together? Yeah, I mean, you know, you try to, you know, you, you try to offer, you know, input when you can as far as, you know, trying to, you know, run as mean and lean, but yet not sacrifice, you know, uh, what the show, you know, uh, what, what the show needs as far as, you know, making the artist, you know, happy and the fans happy, you know. So, um, yeah, so you just try to, you know, you, you you definitely try to, you know, put in the cost effectiveness, you know, and see, you know, how far you can stretch it, you know, without going overboard, you know. So, um, yeah, that's definitely a key, key element. Um, and, the tours that I have worked on have... I've done a variety of different roles, but I have never really been involved in like the full like rehearsal portion of an artist tour. So from my watching of the movie, This Is It, which was the behind the scenes of the Michael Jackson thing that would have happened in London. Yeah. The wow, there is a lot uh, that goes into the rehearsals of a giant production like that. So for an arena tour that maybe is an artist that is, uh, well, for any new tour, even if the artist has been on the road before, how long are, are they in rehearsals? And what are some of the, um, are there the technical rehearsals going on at the same time as the dancer and performer rehearsals? And like, what's that whole scene like? Yeah, I mean, basically, well, let's, I mean, you know, let's say, Let's, let's say there's going to be a week rehearsals, you know? So basically a lot of times if they don't rehearse in their hometown, um, maybe they'll rehearse in the, in the city of the first date. So they'll, they'll work out a deal with the, with the arena, the venue, and they'll set up shop. They'll truck in the gear. So usually the first few days, it's the crew, you know, the production team and the crew and the techs getting the gear set up, testing the gear, uh, you know, going through that. If there's, um, you know, the creative team, depending on if there's video and, and you know, uh, you know, whatever else they're going to put into the show, they're getting set up. So everybody's got, you know, they got to prepare, they got to prep it. So all that has to happen even before the band gets there to start to go up on stage. 
it has to be ready. And then, so let's say that you do two, three days of, you know, load in tech, you know, prep, you know, lighting and stuff, just the basics. Then you get the band in there. They start rehearsing the music with the artist. Um, you know, or the, the, the artist is the band, you know, depending. And then you could, depending on if you have, uh, you know, uh, auxiliary people, you know, I don't know if you have, if some groups have, you know, dancers, and, you know, uh, backup singers, uh, stuff like that. And then that practice, and then, you know, for the lights, they'll want to work with the artist and the band and working on the lighting. And then after they get done, they'll, the lighting crew could go on till two in the morning, you know, programming the lighting and the sound engineer video. So yeah, and then, and then you just start bringing the show together. So I've rehearsed as much as three weeks, you know, for some tours. I've rehearsed four days for some tours. It depends on, you know, the nature of the artist, you know, uh, you know how much they tour uh, and the nature of the tour, if it's a co-headline tour, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, and then sometimes if you're doing festivals, you don't need that much production because you're using the festival's production, you know, so... Uh, if you're doing a festival tour, then, you know, it really cuts down on your need for production. But yeah, no rehearsals. There's a lot going on in rehearsals. And that's when it really, really comes together. And I, I really like being at rehearsals. I find for me, I'm just, uh, you know, I really get to build a tour. I really get to see all the, all the elements, you know, instead of going there in the first show and then, then playing catch up. Yeah being able to be involved from the get-go to uh, understand what's going on and what are all of the expenses and details that are involved with that. So I mean, for rehearsals can get costly, especially if you're doing three weeks and it's a large show, you've got arena rent, uh, rent for wherever it is you're doing this thing. You've mm -hmm. got all the, uh, you know, every day that you've got crew out there, you're paying them. Um, there can be a lot of expenses that really add up for rehearsals yeah hotels you know you know per diem salaries you know you know catering and you know overnight security for the for the gear yeah no it's uh yeah so you, hopefully you can kind of strike some good deals and you can make good uh, you know a good start of the tour you know picking a picking a good city to, to start up in if it's that thing or you can you know um if you're in la or new york or atlanta or san francisco you can you know you can have rehearsals, you know, in a home city. And then basically then oh, you just need a couple of days for load in, you know, cause you definitely want to make sure that, you know, when all the gear gets there, everything works. <laughs> oh yeah. Even if you rehearse somewhere else, you need a cushion of time before that first show to make sure all of the stuff works. They have everything that they need. Yeah. There's always uh, a little bit of uh, figuring out all the puzzle pieces. With that first yeah, show yeah. um, but anyway so like you mentioned so that's uh that startup that's a big element you know the, of the tour for a you know for a you know an average sized arena you know tour so you brought up a great point well thank you um well, you know. <laughs> uh, on the production side so i feel like i've been seeing i don't go to that many shows anymore because you know kids and well and who's going to shows right now anyway but i feel like the production elements themselves are really stepping their game up the sound the lights the video the staging that's got the toasters that pop people up out of the stage and the cherry pickers that get the artists out closer to the fans and the catwalks to another staging thing and all of that stuff um, it seems like the trend has really been like production is getting big these days. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I always thought the production would get maybe smaller because just of the new generation is used to, you know, everything on, you know, phone and social media. And I mean, everything is like smaller, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have big fax machines like we had in the 70s and we don't, you know. Um, so I always thought bands would, would take advantage of, of all the modern technology that we have, but you're right. Production seems to be um, not diminishing. Does, 
have the costs also gone up along with that? Or is there, you know, like now when I go buy a TV, it doesn't cost nearly as expensive as it, it doesn't cost nearly as much as a TV used to cost, right? Relative to things. Have the prices of, has, are people spending more on production is my question, I guess. I think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, videos is, is, is a big component for, I mean, a lot of shows, obviously, you know, I mean, when you sit up in the <clears throat> nosebleed seats, you know, you really, you know, you really count on some nice video screens and video content, you know, as well as, you know, looking at the stage, but you're really far away, you know, if you're in the front row, it's not as important, but I think video content and video is really has really grown over the years, you know, and I think that's, that's probably, you know, a huge cost factor. Um, you know, lighting, you know, you can go crazy with lighting, you know, that's for sure, you know, I mean, lighting and rigging, um, you know, is, uh, is, is another thing that I think it hasn't, is, has only gone up, and sound is, you know, sound has gotten better, I mean, depending on which kind of sound system you go, but yeah, I think the costs, I don't think they've gone down like the TV. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, the artist has a vision for this grand show. Um, they're going to work with the production manager who's going to work with the vendors to come up with an, a, a, a bid for what it's going to cost. And kind of what gets decided in there is really going to have a big impact on the bottom line that you're trying to manage, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So hopefully you can, you can get a few bids, you know, and you can get a little competition going and get a good price, work out a good deal, you know, and go from there. Right. Yeah. And see if, see, see if you can cut out a truck, you know, that's, that's my big thing, you know, well, do you think we can cut out a truck, you know, I mean, because, you know, the less equipment you have, that's the less stage hand bill on the show. You know, so the more trucks, the more gear. That's also adds to the show cost when you're selling the show. So, um, Lord knows, stagehands, you know, don't come cheap in some of the major cities. You know what? Interesting. Uh, so we got a question in the Q and A, um, and it's from somebody anonymous. So thank you, anonymous attendee. Okay. But they are they're asking about, and this is maybe loosely tied into this, but. There's a touring professionals union being proposed or discussed. Um, I didn't know anything about this. Do you know anything about that? Touring professionals union. Oh, yeah. no. First I've heard of it. All yeah. right. That's the first we're hearing of it. So the reason that I brought that question on now is because um, union stagehands um, can significantly affect show costs, which isn't exactly our topic for today. We were more on tour budgets, but whatever. Costs are costs. It all affects the bottom line. Right. Um, I don't know where I was going that, with that question. Union stagehands are significantly more expensive than uh, non-union union stagehands typically. So, right, exactly, yeah. So you know, so you you know, you want to take it like consideration. Like I said, if you can, if you can cut out a truck, you know, then you know that saves a lot. You know, so um, yeah, you know, that's that's kind of how I I kind of view it. You know, but uh, yeah, winter professional touring union huh maybe that's because of all this stuff that's going on now maybe that's maybe there's going to be some changes in the industry i don't be. know yeah so talking about crew um the production manager is the one that is probably looking at who are we going to hire on the crew how much are they going to get paid you're going to be compiling all of that information in, and mm -hmm. uh I, I assume that that's kind of the structure that um yeah, and a lot of production managers, especially production managers that have been around a while, you know, they, they, they have kind of their core team, you know, that they'll travel from tour to tour with, you know, they'll use, you know, a lot of the same, the same people. So it makes it kind of easy who they're going to hire and they, you know, they know their rates and they know stuff like that. So it, uh, it kind of falls in, but yeah, yeah. So you do a kind of a, you know, sometimes I like to do a budget. I like to do like a people schedule. I call it a people schedule. How much is this person on the tour worth, right? So they're going to get a they're going to get a fee, a weekly fee, and they're going to get a weekly per diem. You know, when you're 50 miles away from home, you can collect a per diem, and if you're on payroll, it's non-taxable. And um, and then you, you know, this person may need transportation to and from the airport to fly to the first city or rehearsals. 
and they're going to need a hotel room. And then, so a lot of times I like to find out, well, if we add this person, how much does that cost to the bottom line? You know, because everybody has, has a value. So, you know, if you can, if you can, uh, you know, uh, look at that from that perspective and also kind of builds into the budget because with the budget, obviously you're, you're, you got to figure out all the transportation and uh, transportation and hotel costs and the, you know, travel costs. Yes, that's actually where I was going next. So transportation costs. I mean, obviously there's a wide range of uh, ways people can get from place to place. Um, for the context of today, we're generally talking about buses, but I would think that sometimes you work with some artists that might um, fly and hub out of uh, a city. Do you, do you have artists that hub? I'm not asking any specific ones, but. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I've been on tours where there's no buses. It's strictly just, you know, charter, you know, or, you know, commercial, you know, depending on things. Sometimes, you know, um, I know I did, I did one tour where we were in, we did four nights in each city. So buses would be sitting idle. Right. So we just flew commercial, you know, it was kind of a, that was the theme of that tour. Um, if you go to Australia, there are no buses because cities are so far apart you have to fly from city to city because it's you know really incredible you know the distance but uh no i've been in u.s tours where, where it's just been charter yeah. yeah so the um the decisions on what transportation method to use aren't necessarily dependent i mean obviously the bottom line has something to do with it but it sounds like a lot of it has to do with what like it, it makes sense if you're in a place for four days get hotels, let people kind of like settle in and have their hotel and then fly to the next city. Or, you know, there's other factors that can influence whether you're doing buses or, or fly dates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, I'd say probably, you know, probably the majority of like, you know, arena tours and that are buses, you know, it's just, just kind of easier, especially you can get more back to backs and, you know, obviously you want to try and do as many shows as you can per week. If you can do three, four shows a week, you know, it's a lot better than doing two a week. So that'll, that'll really help on your, you know, your weekly, you know, nut. Yeah. So, uh, or more, I did one tour. We did, we did six shows a week. Boy, you really look forward to Were you on the Warp Tour also? Oh my gosh. I, you know. Yeah. Six well, shows you know, is our minimum. We would have like 13 shows in a row sometimes. You know, I worked on that tour for three years. Did you really? Yeah, I saw one routing was 28 shows in a row. And they asked me if I wanted to go. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> no, I did that. No, we, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was one of our clients for us. So it's kind of interesting how we share that oh, as well. So yeah, because yeah. that is not how we know each other. So, yeah, that's, um, that's... yeah, 28 in a row. It's, uh, we would always have a 13 in a row because normally we would have Mondays off. Shows aren't great to do on Mondays, but Charlotte was great on Mondays. I don't know how they, they like tried it once and discovered like everybody in Charlotte loves to go out on Mondays. And so then that Monday got w wiped out of the off day and we just went straight on through. Um, so hotels, a lot of times at the level of touring that you're doing, you'll have the band might stay in uh, one level of hotel, the crew might stay in a different hotel, drivers might stay somewhere else. Like, is that purely financially driven or are there personal preferences involved in everybody being in the same place or not? Or like, how's, I'm sure it's- Yeah, sometimes, you know, I, I, on a really big tour, I always suggest that we break up the, you know, the band and crew. And you know why that is? Because on days off, boy, the internet with sh shrinks. You know, if you put 50 guys in a hotel, 50, I mean, you know, so I like to kind of, you know, split up things, you know. I know that's, that's strange, isn't it? But you'd be surprised, you know, everyone's like on a night off, everyone's Skyping home and everyone's going online and paying their bills and doing stuff. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, downloading, watching Netflix. So, you know. You know, I kind of like to break it up a little bit, but I mean, on a smaller tour, you could, you know, everybody would be at the same hotel, you know, obviously, you know, and as the tour gets bigger, you know, a lot of times you do, you see the crew hotel, uh, the band hotel, the band and artist, you know, um, that kind of thing. 
and they're really really huge tours i mean you, you have lots of hotels you know so but uh yeah i mean there's there's some cost considerations i mean obviously we we try and you know we try and do the best with hotels working with the travel agent that's usually the tour manager and the travel agent knowing you know the needs of the tour knowing the needs of the crew uh sometimes the crew like to be really close to the venue it makes it easy um you know so a lot of times you'll find you'll find that happening uh a lot of times depending on if there's a day off that may be a consideration for the hotel oh the guys have worked hard there's a day off let's pick a little bit nicer area to have a hotel in but if you're doing three in a row you're not gonna you know you don't really see the hotel that much so the hotel doesn't become as much as a priority um and i gotta get my 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 phone is dying oh no go get so, your charger real quick so, so talk to everybody real quick while i get my charger okay all right friends um so throw the questions in the q a or in the chat uh we've got a couple of things that uh people have already uh kind of asked about um, okay I'll just take this opportunity to mention, not only did we spend a lot of time in baseball parks, you and I, we spent a lot of time in the press boxes of those baseball parks. Oh, so, we sure did, huh? Yep, Boy. It was, uh, the press box was the ideal uh, production office because we could, uh, it was a nice space. It usually had air conditioning and you could, we would look out and be able to kind of see, the production guys really liked it because they were able to look out and see all the stuff that was happening uh, on the stage build. And it was nice to have windows, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Boy, was that hot at some of those places, wow. I just remember the heat. I remember doing Maryland, oh, it was so hot there. Boy, that Maryland has humidity like I've never felt. So the Aberdeen Ironbirds? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh goodness gracious! I mean, I, I went back to the hotel and I, you know, I got a thing of Haagen Dazs ice cream. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you are so is... wild and crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I guess I should have had a beer, but oh well. Anyways, um, I think I've seen you drink half a beer once. Yeah, well, there you go. I, huh? For whatever reason, I have a picture of that, uh, and you had some caution tape tied onto it. I don't. That's... <laughs> Oh dear. Times yeah. on tour, we are wild and crazy people. Um, okay, so I want to make sure that we've kind of hit the big categories of tour budget. We've talked about wages, we've talked about vendors, we've talked about transportation, um, both people and trucks. Um, I don't have my list right in front of me. Oh, insurance. Do you, how involved in insurance conversations are you, or is that something that happens and they say, write the check for it? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, that really falls into our business management lap, you know, because production managers and tour managers are kind of out of that loop. So yeah, we'll, you know, that's re usually when the main impetus, all the elements that we just discussed, you know, production and payroll and wages and trucks and buses and planes and hotels, when that's all taken care of, you know, then comes the, you know, the professional fees, insurances, you know, liability insurance, um, you know, non-owned auto, you know, you want to have, you know, a tr a auto insurance, and there's all kinds of insurances you can get. I mean, non-appearance insurance, cancellation insurance. Um, and then also there might be legal fees. You might have some lawyer, you know, reviewing contracts or vendor agreements. So you might have some legal fees to add into the budget. Um, you know, you might have um, uh, accounting fees for prep <laughs> um, and stuff like that. Yeah, so, um, you know, so that kind of rounds out the overall tour budget, you know, uh, as far as that goes with the professional fees. And then you throw in a contingency, like I said, the more you know, the less the contingency. And like you mentioned, it is kind of a, 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 a you know, a work in progress as you go along, you know? So um, I always tell people don't put Wisconsin in the beginning of a tour because they want if for a, a tax reduction they want a 30-day window before the first show mm. so if your first show a lot of times you know your budget is done usually a few days before you get ready to go out sometimes yeah. you know because you're really pulling things together the artist says oh by the way i think i'd like to add this you know 
or you're taking away something, you know, maybe, oh, we really don't need this, you know, let's, uh, you know, we can, we can get by with four buses instead of five, you know. So uh, if you put Wisconsin a little later on, you know, then it gives you a little breathing room, you know. Some of the other states are, are a little more generous, you know, you can, a week, you know, two weeks before the show. How did the agents so. feel about uh, your input on where to schedule Wisconsin on the tour? Oh, they don't care. Yeah, they <laughs> just, you know, that's between me and the wall usually, you know. But, you know, yeah. I just, um, you know, you know, you can't interfere with routing. I mean, let's face it, you know, you're, you're looking at a veils and it doesn't always work out. So, uh, yeah, so I'll let them, you know, yeah, the routing, it's like we always say that's the dartboard, right? That's the darts. And why are we going here from there? Weren't we just there? Hey, but, I did know. a whole workshop on routing that did the subtitle is, we didn't just throw darts at a map. Okay, well, let's see. There you go. That's kind of the standard jargon. Yeah, anyways. Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of the budget. And then and then you go from there and hopefully uh, the budget is your Bible and you, you want to make it realistic. I mean, you don't want to make a budget that's, you know, so overblown that, you know, look, we came in under budget. Well, of course you came in under budget because you just blew everything up, you know. And you don't want to make it too lean and mean, and then you're over budget. What went wrong? So a budget, really, the overall budget when you're said and done, you really want to make it as realistic as possible. Somebody once told me that the motion pictures uh, budget, when they do the budgeting for motion pictures, that uh, when they come under budget, the the motion picture execs go, "Why are we under budget?" And then when they go over budget, they go, "Why are we over budget?" But if you come on budget, they go, oh, good. Okay, we're on budget. <laughs> I mean, they really like to be on budget. I mean, they really, I mean, that's how fine-tuned they really like to do it, you know. Um, so, and I think I, a lot of times I like that with the tour budget. You know, I, I like to, you know, not be, not be too off, but, yeah. you know. Well, to switch for one second from tour budgets over to show budgets, I mean, I know that, that that's something that we both as – to our accountant people and me when I was a talent buyer talking to you about it, we'd be like, who made this budget? Like, where did these numbers come from? <laughs> did somebody just like pick them out of a hat? Um, and so really understanding how those numbers were arrived at and having good estimates, I think I certainly value as somebody's paying attention to their job and really thinking about this and not just putting in a number that makes the, the bottom line work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that once there's a real number in there, then you can have better conversations about uh, about that number, right? Where if it's just, oh, this was what we did last year, or this is, this is the number that I stuck in because it seemed like it would make the math work. Um, it's harder to have real conversations about that. Um, I've seen those. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've seen those. So international, I have in my career, not had the opportunity yet to do any real international touring. I've done uh, primarily domestic stuff. Um, you have done lots of international. So is there anything that on an international front, what are you thinking about? What are the added expenses, uh, considerations? Mm -hmm. currency exchange? Well, uh, on insurances, you need, you know, foreign, uh, you know, um, liability, uh, foreign workers comp. You know, so from the insurance uh, aspect, and you may want to, you know, that, uh, taking into consideration the climate of the world, you might want to have a little bit of a terrorism or, you know, um, you know, insurance. Um, so uh, it's it certainly adds on to the insurance when you travel, you know, foreign. Uh, airfares certainly increase, you know, tenfold, uh, especially how people travel. But uh, and depending on where you're going. Um, on a side note, oh, the poor airline industry, I'm, it's going to be curious to see, you know, what's going to happen when everything, you know, starts to get back to semi-normal, um, you know, as far as rates and things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, what else? Uh, obviously you have to deal with foreign currency. So, um, you know, there's that consideration, which doesn't really affect the budget that much. You just want to make sure that you're not going into a lot of currency conversion costs. You know, whether you're getting Euro for Europe, uh, you know, the pounds for, uh, uh, you know, uh, England, 
uh, Australian dollars when you go to Australia and so on and so forth. So because you do need working cash on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to pay, you know, production expenses, uh, after show food, uh, and, you know, um, just miscellaneous items that, you know, you can, you can, you want to use local currency for. So, um, but yeah, it, you just want to make sure you want to, you know, uh, uh, get the best, you know, rates you can. Usually I just pull my cash from the shows and try and then get rid of it before we go to the next territory. Uh, what else on foreign tours? Um, yeah, let's see. I mean, really just the cost, you know, um, the cost could go up. Uh, sometimes per diem rates might be a little bit higher depending on how the, the value of the dollar is. You know, if the dollar is, is weak, it might be more expensive. So the per diem rates could go up from the U.S. rates. So if you're paying $40 a day in the U.S., uh, your per diem rates for Europe could be 60 mm -hmm. or Japan. Uh, right now, the dollar is really strong, so it's not as much of a factor, you know. But I've seen per diem rates when the dollar was really weak and things were really expensive. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, that would, uh, you know, that would be, a, a, you know, an element to consider. So um, both in the chat and in the Q&A, and this is where I was going with this, is the other day we were talking uh, to a tour manager who does primarily club level tours. And on the sheet that he had inherited from somebody, his spreadsheet uh, was, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct, Carnet? Carnet, uh, customs and all that, yeah. Yeah, so can you explain what is Carnet and why it would be an expense on a tour budget? Um, a lot of times we try to put that in as a show cost, you know, um, you know, um, but basically on certain countries, obviously the, the gear has to be, you know, the trucks come over with gear and they have to be inspected by the customs, you know, so you want to kind of, uh, go through that, go through that. So, uh, do I put that in the budget? Um, I don't really use that as a budget item, you know, to tell well, you the truth, so really. The fee is... I think we're still even trying to get it because it's not something that I know the per the perfect answer. Yeah. Is it a fee? Yeah, there's like a fee. You know, a lot of times we'll put like when we go to Canada, we'll cross the border, we'll put in as a show cost, especially if we're doing, you know, we're doing five shows or seven shows in Canada and we can, you know, justify it coming in and coming out. Yeah. Oh, okay, I saw something up there. <laughs> Carnet, Carnival, not Carnet, fees and duties on gear used to make money while working in country. Um, oh, Carney. It's pronounced Carney, not Carnet. Uh, oh, Carney. Oh. No, hey, we're Carney. Carney, talking no. about Carney here. Carney. No. It looks, yeah. anyway. It, I but think I don't deal, I, I, you know, that's more of a production manager. I don't really deal with that a lot, you know, like I've seen as a, we put like it a as a show cost. Is it like a brokerage fee? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, if you are taking things across the border, you can uh, hire a, a broker to help facilitate that process and uh, verify that you are doing the things that you're supposed to do if you're crossing the border. Hey, have you, um, do you, as a tour accountant, when I was doing Warp Tour and we would go into Canada, I would always like, if you have more than ten thousand dollars you have to declare it and then you have to like i don't know get it out and count it or something so i would always drop my cash to below ten thousand before crossing the border i assume you do the same yeah i mean it depends i mean i don't do it all the time i mean it depends i mean a lot of people you know it's so funny because some people have a um you know a misunderstanding like you can bring over as much money as you want right. across a lot of different borders you just have to declare it you know, so a lot of people think it's, I've had people say, isn't it illegal to bring more than 10,000? I go, no, no, it's not illegal. You just have to declare it. Um, but, uh, and do you know also in Canada, it's not only if you picked up a check, you know, from the venue, you know, that's also considered part of your 10,000? I did not know that. Yeah. I feel so, like you're probably always wired. Yeah. Yeah, so wiring is good, but if you picked up a check, you know, checks and cash, that all adds into the same thing. So you know, but uh, I think the one of the one of the main reasons why we we try to reduce our cash if we're on like a bus tour or crossing the border, we don't want to hold anybody up, 
mm-hmm. by me going in and having to, you know, declare the cash and fill out forms and all that stuff. So sometimes it just makes it easier to, <laughs> to get through the border, you know, quick. Yeah. But if I'm flying in sometimes and I'm bringing cash, I don't have a problem because it's just me. I'm flying in, maybe meeting up, joining the tour, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I jump from so many tours, you know, tour to tour. I'm not even go home. So uh, sometimes I'll just fly to the next tour. You know, if it's just me, then I don't mind, you know, uh, filling out the form and declaring cash. I've done it many, many times. And you like, you declare it but with the form, but do you also have to like count it and verify it with him? Not really. Oh, you know, you I think, I think one, time, one time I think I had to count it. Got it. Which is kind of weird. But no, usually they just kind of, you know, take your verbal statement and signature yeah. and put down the amount. And of course, when you fly internationally, you got to report it before you leave the country. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I go to LAX and then I get my ticket and then I go over to Homeland Security and give them the form. It's already filled out. They stamp it and stamp my ticket. And that way I can go through um, security. There, so, so there you are. Um, so it, it's a little bit more on the kind of like show end, but I know that when um, we would settle shows together, you kept a close eye on the box office revenue side. And can you, can you talk a little bit about like, I don't know, what are you looking for on a show settlement on the revenue side to make sure that things are on the up and up and how they're supposed to be? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I have a saying, you know, my, my biggest fear is not, what I'm looking at, you know, I'm, I'm working through all the numbers, the box office reports, you know, the unsold tickets and the comp tickets and all that stuff. And uh, depending on the, the nature of the tickets, the, you know, any of the uplifts, uh, platinum ticketing, um, you know, discounted tickets, right, Groupon sales. But I always tell myself, I'm seeing everything here and I'm going through it, but what am I not seeing? <laughs> And that's my biggest fear is like, am I missing something? Am I not asking a question? Should I, is there something that, you know, I'm overlooking that I shouldn't, you know, that's what I think. It's not, I, I know what I'm looking at, but is there something yeah. I'm not seeing? <laughs> but yeah, but basically, you know, you want to reconcile with the box office. You want to ask the right questions, you know, at settlement. One of my biggest, my, one of my biggest uh, nitpicking is that, when I'm working with the, the box office will come down, give us the final box office reports and the building statements, right? And then I'll work with the promoter to settle the show. But I always say, don't let the box office leave because they always want to like close out, do the reports and then go home. I go, no, 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 we need the box office there in case we have a question, you know? Like what happened to this row that we killed, you know, uh, or whatever. And so many times we get the box office reports and I say, can I ask the box office a question? Oh, they went home. <laughs> go, Darn. What do you mean they went home? I guess they've been there all day and they want to get home. But yeah, so I, I try to have the box office there, you know, so I can ask any questions. Yeah. Because that's, that's key. That's, that's the whole revenue end of it, you know. Or if you have questions on uh, things that the box office had to deal with, with, um, uh, Oh, wow, there's a squirrel out there. Um, <laughs> Nature. Sorry. All right, yeah. Uh, you know, if you have like an add-on for record sales, you know, sometimes you have an add-on and they have to reconcile their platinum tickets. You want to make sure that the box office is reconciled with any outside group, you mm-hmm. know, that's affecting, you know, the sales, you know. So, you know, the box office person is important. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, overall what I look for. On the expense side of show settlements, since we're on that topic, um, what are some of the big things that you're really kind of checking off your list to make sure you've looked at, and what kind of questions do you find you're asking the promoters a lot? Well, um, I go through advertising, which I hate doing. That's my worst thing. I hate going through advertising, you know. But anyways, I do it. But I think probably, you know, I, 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 I want to look at the soft costs, if we can kind of, you know, see any, if there's any soft costs. I mean, I think now things have changed so much, you know, it used to be a telephone charge and things like that. But I think now, you know, I mean, everybody has, their, you know, we don't have venue phones aren't as important as they were 20 years ago. You know, everybody now has, 
you know, everything on their computer and cell phones and all that stuff. So, but I think I'll look at some of the venue soft costs and see where we can, you know, where and when we you can, say soft uh, cost, you're talking about things that are being itemized from the venue that they didn't have to go out and actually purchase for this particular show. Like that, the internet, like internet charge. I so said, why, why are we, why are we having an internet charge? I mean, you need to be on the internet because you're, you're emailing me box office reports. You need it as much as I need it. You know, so why are we being charged for that? I mean, it's just, you know, costing you a business. I once, I once argued about the rent in the building. I once argued about the, the toilets. I don't know why it was in Pennsylvania. I it made no sense to me at the time, but what, you know. What? what? All right, I need more information. So were they trying to charge you for toilet paper? Cause I've seen that. I've been like, you've got to be kidding me. There's no way you're putting toilet paper in as a show expense or you know, was it like, what, what about I, the toilets? Were you arguing? I don't know. I can't remember. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I was, I was just on a rampage, you know, and I was saying, well, like, we, there's certain things you need, you know, there's certain necessities, you know. I mean, you yeah. can't do anything without that, you know. Yeah. Um, but what are some of the costs? I mean, obviously, you want to make sure you get, you know, that you want to work with the production manager about stagehands because stagehands a big number, and you want to make sure that all the guys showed up and the load in, load out numbers look correct. Um, you know, and the, and the, and the show call numbers, right. Um, you want to look at any, um, like if we need any equipment, you know, do we really need a forklift? Sometimes they want to charge for two forklifts and then I go to the production manager and they said, no, no, I told them to get rid of that other forklift. We only need one forklift today. You know, so you want to, you know, definitely touch base with that, you know, transportation, um, you know, uh, you know, the runners, you know, you know, if, if we have three runners and three vans, I, I talk to the production team and say, do we have all these runners? Um, I work a lot with catering. I know catering really good. I've worked a lot with catering over the years, so I'm pretty nitpicky with catering. Um, if if catering is lousy, you know, I'll let them know. <laughs> um, you know, if it's absorbing a shock, because I've, I've worked with a lot with catering. You know, I've worked a lot with catering, a lot with merchandising. So, um, you know, I know, I know, uh, I know some good stuff about that. Uh, what else on the show costs? I don't know. Just, you know, you just want to make sure that, you know, you compare it to the budget, like you were saying, you know, the promoter puts together the budget. So you want to see how close you came to the budget. If you come under, that's great. You know, if, you know, sometimes they miss it. They miss the ball and, or sometimes the show changed, you know, but if the show didn't do well and they're, they're they cut down the arena to just, you know, the floor and the, you know, the first level, you know, and they, they curtained off the top level. Maybe you didn't need the security that you needed when the budget was put together for a sold, sold out show. So I'll look at things like that. I remember it was, I mean, it was maybe a week or two into our first ballpark tour and you walked in and said to me, do you think we really need all this stuff? <laughs> I was like, I don't really know how to answer that. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not in charge of whether we need a stage. Like, yes, I think we need a stage. I can't control how many forklifts the production people say we need. So I'm like, yes, yes, I guess we do need all this stuff, but maybe we should ask. Uh, I was like, let, let me go ask if we need all this. You know, it's funny. I, you know, you know I, I speak at some USC classes, right? And, uh, I brought that up to the professor one day and he did a whole panel on that up yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, all the stuff. Yeah. Because well, one day I went into load in, I, I was there in the morning, you know, like seven o'clock in the morning or something. I went over to the venue and just watched them, you know, bringing in the gear, doing the rigging and, and get, you know, sp you know, flying the speakers. And I was just watching them going, wow, they're going to do all this all morning. Then they're going to do the line check. Then the band's going to come in and rehearse. And then we're going to go to catering. Then the audience comes in. Then we're going to do the show. And then after the show, they're going to take all this down, put it back in the truck, trucks. And then the next morning, another band's going to come in, take out all the gear and, and the same thing. And I, and I said to myself, why are we doing this, right? I mean, that's yeah. just kind of the way it is. So I mentioned that to the professor. And so he got all on. He said almost the same thing you did. Do we really need all this stuff? And he did a whole panel on it. He got like lighting, video, sound engineers. He got uh, 
tour managers and they had a panel. I was on the road. I couldn't, because uh, I wanted to attend the, the panel, but I couldn't. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was interesting. I think, but that's the nature of the business. Yeah. I mean, that's the nature of the business. So, I mean, to go one step further, when you do a festival and you have five bands on the, on the bill, right? And three support bands, everybody's using the same gear. They're using the same sound, the same lights. Mm -hmm. They're bringing their, you know, they're bringing some of their, you know, backline gear and they're bringing some of their, you know, I don't know, onboard stuff. But other than that, you know, everybody is sharing the same gear, right? And somebody said, well, that's because the festivals are great. We make a lot of money. I go, that's why you make a lot of money at festivals because you're using shared production, you know? Yeah. So when you have your standalone tour, you're not, you're not sharing production. Sometimes when you do the stadiums, uh, you know, the weekend stadium shows, you know, there'll be three, maybe three, you know, two artists, you know, you have somebody on Friday night and some on Saturday, they can kind of cut those costs because they can share the, share the cost for the, you know, the stage and the steel build and all that stuff. So, um, but, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's where that came from. Why are we bringing all this stuff? Do we really need it? I might do, a, now I'm inspired to do a workshop titled, Do We Really Need All This Stuff? That'd be great. That'd be great. I might I have to bring it back on. And you can lead it out. Like, you, you can do the catchphrase for it. All right. Um, that sounds great. Yeah. But. Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, as, as I mean, and maybe you have an opinion on this, maybe you don't. I'm not asking you to, you know write anything in stone but as touring does pick up again um a previous panelist had mentioned that like maybe we'll be going out with less stuff because that would be less people it would be easier to i don't know be safe do you think i think I, I mean I, I i i foresee maybe there might be some cost saving um you know um uh, things that that might be in place you know uh only because the industry certainly has 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 encountered a huge setback i mean it's just this is just major i mean nothing like this has ever happened the machine has stopped and we're on the kind of you know the end of the train as far as large social gatherings you know what's going to open up first obviously is the necessary and the safe you know, business environments and stuff like that. So sports events, Broadway, music concerts, we're on the tail end of this, uh, getting back to, you know, trying to get as normal as we can. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm an accountant. I like cost savings, you know, but that's what accountants do, right? You know? It's uh, fun to get nerdy about the numbers and figure yeah. out how to... Uh, save some money. All right, we have uh, questions. Okay, well, let's see if we can. Let's see if we can do it. Is a video of the panel online? Um, I think he's asking about the one that you were talking about that you did at the college. The, what, why is it? Called? Oh, oh is, why, is it, was really it? All this stuff? I don't know if it was um, on, like, me, like on, on YouTube or something, if you can go on yeah. and look at that. Yeah. You know, I'd have to ask about that. I don't know. I, I didn't see it. I mean, I don't know whether it was just, I don't know. I don't know if we recorded it, but, uh, but I'll, I'll ask and I'll let you know. Yeah. If you want to let me know, that would be great. Cause I would certainly share that with everybody. I'd be interested okay. in seeing that as well. Um, theater tours have found that if you can stay for a few days, you make more than double your money per day. But then again, even Cirque du Soleil has moved from multi-week tent shows to arena tours. Um, I think just kind of a comment there. Um, shirts, like when a show sits down in a theater for multiple days, there is some cost savings because you don't have a load in and a load out every day, right? Correct, that's a, that's a big savings, right? For sure. Um, you're not moving transportation, you know, so you're not moving, you don't have to fly. Uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, get the buses going, you know, uh, so that's the savings. Yeah. The more intimate experience with the audience to play in a theater for four days versus playing in an arena for one day. Mm -hmm. So part of it, I imagine, is artistic uh, vibe. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, I mean, for sure. I mean, I've always, I always felt theaters are great experiences. You know, everybody's got a, a, you know, a good seat and maybe even charge a little bit more because everybody's got a great seat and, and yeah. it is more intimate, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways to kind of cut the apple, you know, depending on what you're doing. I mean, it really is, you know, I mean, and that's, that's another, that's another thing. Well, did the stones do a, what was that sh tour where they did, uh, didn't they do a club theater and a arena or stadium? Yes, I think so. But you know what? Jam just posted about the other day, Jam Productions in Chicago posted about this day in history or whatever, the incredible shrinking tour of Bob Dylan that did Aragon, uh, Park yeah, we West. did. Like, I mean, it was like progressively, like Aragon, Riviera, Park West, and I don't remember what the double door or something insanely small. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, well, that was nice. So yeah, fun. so there's all kinds of yeah, there's all kinds of ways to go. Yeah, but uh, they said that you know it's funny. I I heard on the news today uh, that being outdoors is a, is a bit safer with the uh, virus going on right now mm -hmm. than indoors. So I'm wondering if the sheds will have um, you know a lot of activity because everybody's outside rather than inside. Yeah, and you know what I had seen um, over kind of uh, a, a chunk of time, things that could be playing sheds in the summer was actu were actually playing arenas more, I assume to take away the weather considerations, to be able to do more extensive customized stage productions, um, that type of stuff. So there was like a bunch of shows for a few summers that were in arenas that I was like, why aren't they just playing the sheds? Um, I wonder, I bet there will, I bet next summer the sheds will be, if, if shows are, if big shows are happening, I bet the sheds are gonna be the place to be. They're gonna be filled up. Yeah, yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Um, well, one thing about shows sitting in the same place for a while, us roadies get itchy like uh, to like move on. And <laughs> I know, I know, oh boy, that's true. Huh. It's like day four, when I, when I, when I would see a, a tour, as a talent buyer and it was like day four that they were in Chicago, they were just like, we're ready to go somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I was in 10 days in London. Oh my God, I was like, oh, this is like. I know you're like crawling out of your skin being at home for so long and can't wait to get. Yeah, I don't know. It, yeah, this is, I mean, I, okay is now, but then I'm thinking, wow, June, July, August, September, October, November, what's Mikey gonna do? I don't know. Anyways, we'll yeah. just. I guess we'll just make it up as we go. Yeah. So uh, when you are not on tour, you're still doing other um, work for your clients on other aspects of their career or stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, I, I you know, I come home. I mean, obviously there's advancing and starting up the next tour. Uh, my downtime is usually, usually January and February is usually my downtime for the year. Um, you know, and then tours start up again in the spring. So, you know, then, and then pretty much, you know, May is my worst month because summer tours are starting and that's, you know, the budgeting process and just getting me going. Plus I have a, you know, I have a heavy workload anyways in May. Um, yeah. And then fall, you know, is, is, uh, can, from summer continues right into the fall and then December kind of winds down, you know, and the, take the holidays and close out the year and then january and february i do gardening at home oh that's nice yeah. especially that you live in a place that you can garden in january and february yeah that's true i'm very lucky yeah so that's what i do and then go back on the road but uh yeah i, I enjoy it and i miss it so um we'll see what's gonna happen but uh anyways uh well you know let's just say stay safe and healthy i guess that's key yeah it sure is um well i think we hit on all kind of the big things that i wanted to talk to you about you've been really helpful and informative as oh, great. i well thank you thanks everybody for listening i and hope something everyone should know that mike installed zoom and made this happen special for this no and lord i appreciate the technological uh effort that was put into I'm Is trying. Here today? I don't know when I can get a haircut, but um, you know, we'll see. Get the wife to cut it for you. 
Yeah, maybe, huh? Yeah. I have my husband cut my, I think tomorrow we're going to get the sides done again. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you so much. And You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Jen, it's been great uh, working with you again on this. Um, yeah, I, I, I missed you. So this is good. So um, I guess I'll sign off and uh, I'll look forward to catching another workshop. All right. Well, thank you. And I will certainly send you a link to when this is live on jenkellogg.com. And uh, you can... Uh, I don't know what you'll do with that, but uh, hopefully you'll tell your friends. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Bye. See ya. Bye.